Software and software engineering have changed tremendously over the years. Can you imagine that in the first five years of Microsoft, Bill Gates would review each and every line of code that Microsoft shipped? And if he found something that he didn't like, he would rewrite it himself? Nowadays, software is so large and so complex that a single individual could never understand or maintain it entirely by him or herself. For example, the Linux kernel in 2012 contained more than 15 million lines of code and was being developed by more than 1300 developers. That's almost twice as many Linux developers as PhD candidates currently at this university and more than 10 times more lines of code than lines of text in scientific publications from the TUE last year. So how do they do it? The secret, as you probably have guessed, is collaboration. Developers collaborate, communicate and coordinate their efforts and only so they are able to manage large projects. Naturally, software engineering research has also changed. While historically the focus was on technical improvements, with time researchers have realized that software is developed by people and for people. As a consequence, a new discipline that looks at software engineering as a collaborative, knowledge-intensive and human-centric activity was born. But where does my thesis fit into this story? What fascinates me about open collaborations such as those in open source, if you recall the example of the Linux kernel I gave earlier, is not that they succeed, but rather that they succeed despite people participating in them being so different. Typically they are a mixture of volunteers and professionals, they come from a mixture of cultural and educational backgrounds, they are interested in, motivated by and good at different things and they are geographically located all over the world. And while most of the previous work in this area has, has considered these people to be equal, my thesis focuses on exactly this diversity, how differences between participants in a single community or differences between communities relate to individual level and community level outcomes. Look around you, we are all different in some way. If we can understand how to harness these differences, we can have much more effective collaborations. So what will you find inside my thesis? You will find a series of empirical studies of some of today's hot online software communities, such as GitHub, by far the largest code host in the world, with millions of developers and projects, or Stack Overflow, the largest and most popular programming Q&A platform. You will find answers to questions that relate, for example, diversity of activities within a community to specialization of work, or diversity of activities across communities or platforms to individual working rhythms, or diversity of incentives between different platforms to both positive and negative effects on productivity and engagement. To carry out all these studies, we had to break ground in several ways that I believe will significantly advance the field. For example, careful and robust techniques to extract and analyze large amounts of data, or methods and tools to link users within and across information sources if they contributed under different aliases. Obviously, I cannot cover all the details during this very short presentation. Still, to give you a flavor of all the things possible using these techniques, I would like to mention two themes that came up repeatedly during different studies included in this thesis. The first theme is that of specialization. In a collaborative effort, specialization of participants is a key component to the group's success. In the economic literature, the debate has gone on for a long time about how specialized agents in an economy should be. The consensus seems to be that high specialization of knowledge is desirable, but also that islands of shared knowledge should exist. That is, everyone should be as specialized as possible while still allowing some overlap in knowledge between agents. According to this principle, on the left there is too little specialization, since everyone is responsible for the same thing, and on the right there is too much specialization, since no, minions can, no two minions can do the same thing. The sweet spot according to this model is somewhere in between. Specialization comes up in multiple chapters of this thesis. 
I'll give you an example from chapter 2 where we try to gauge how much of it there is in a successful open source community, the GNOME ecosystem, and also to which extent such islands of shared knowledge are visible. For GNOME, we distinguish between different activity types such as writing code, working on translation or contributing to documentation. Then, using historical trace data, we measured for each person the fraction of effort spent in different activity types. To decide whether to call a person specialized or not, we computed Gini coefficients. If you spread your effort evenly between different activities, such as on the left, your Gini score would be close to zero. Otherwise, if most of your time goes into only one activity, such as on the right, then your Gini score would be close to one. The box plot you see here shows the distribution of such Gini coefficients for all contributors to know. You can see that overall there is a very high level of specialization. Most people contribute to few activities since their Gini coefficients are high and close to the theoretical maximum. This is a more refined visualization where we break down each person's effort by activity. Each activity has a separate box plot and you see what fraction of their time people typically spend doing this. So for instance, someone doing mostly localization and a few other things would contribute a point close to one in the localization box plot and a few other points close to zero in her other activities and so on. This visualization allows us to observe how the islands of shared knowledge form in some activities preferentially compared to others. For example, if you look at coding and localization, they are both relatively specialized compared to others because of the higher box plots, but coding is much more specialized than localization. Islands of shared knowledge seem harder to form in coding. The second theme I want to mention is that of signaling. Signaling theory is popular in biology, where the classical example is the male peacock's tail as a sign of his fitness. The tail is the handicap, an ornament which is costly to maintain and it also makes the bird more vulnerable to predators. However, having survived despite this handicap, he is perceived by females as being more attractive and more fit. A similar argument can be made regarding education. Obtaining a degree from the TUE is a handicap signal. You spend a lot of effort obtaining it, but it's worth much more than degrees from other schools in the eyes of employers. Guess what? It's not just peacocks that like to signal. Developers like to signal too, and you'll find numerous examples of this in my thesis. I'm going to mention one from chapter 5. In the R community, there are two prominent places where users can get help. The mailing lists, historically the most prominent, and social Q&A sites such as Stack Overflow, which are becoming more and more popular these days. Some of the R developers are active on the mailing lists, some on Stack Overflow, and some on both. This is the signal. Hey, look at me, I'm better than these other people because I'm active on both platforms. We wanted to understand how much of a handicap this is, how much effort is spent in generating the signal, therefore how reliable the signal is. To understand this, we compared the effort spent by people who use both channels to that of people who use only one of the two, either one of the two. What we found was fascinating. They give four times more answers on the mailing list than those who only answer on the mailing list, and three times more answers on Stack Exchange than those who only answer on Stack Exchange. These people sure like to signal. But wait, it gets better. If for these people who contribute to both communities we compare the speed with which they give answers in one versus the other, you see the mailing lists on the left and Stack Overflow on the right, we find a ratio of almost 4 to 1. The same people are 4 times faster in one platform than the other. Why do you think that is? Because on Stack Overflow people vote for how good or bad questions and answers are. More votes translate to more reputation points on the site, more badges and more privileges, and all of these are automatically aggregated and visible on your profile page as a sign of recognition. 
So they don't just like to signal, they love to signal. I'd like to leave you at this. I hope I managed to spark your interest in social aspects of collaboration in online software communities. And I would like to invite you to read my thesis. Thank you.